Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over the top, beautiful uh, day here in the Orwellian police state lockdown here in Garfield, Texas on this just postcard perfect Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday in uh, the collapse of the global industrial economy, uh, April 12, 2020, when what an Easter it is. Uh, I am in the middle of holding an open house, probably the only human being on the planet doing that today. And so I have found that if I start making videos that it has an unbelievable way of actually bringing people to an open house. So I'm going to do a long video here uh, today and this being Sunday, it, I'll, this gets to double as both my, uh, my doomsday sermon on that over there and, uh, and a combination collapse chronicle and coronavirus chronicle. I get to kill three birds with one stone and I just need to a quick apology uh, about this week's interview. We had some serious technical difficulties. We tried to save it, but uh, it would have just been pointless for me to run the interview. The audio quality was to the point where it would have been just pointless for me to do it. Hopefully, uh, the nice fellow will uh, agree to <clears throat> anyway, I will see what I can do about, uh, about fixing that big ugly mess, but there will be no interview this week. But uh, anyway, in its place, we're going to go over here, interestingly enough, to the Financial Times for this long uh, piece, uh, the Financial Times of all places. Uh, I like, uh, this is under their weekend long reads <laughs> desk, nonfiction, I love it, they, they let you know that this is nonfiction, we shall see whether it's nonfiction or not, with the title, How to Save the Human Race from Extinction, this is by a fellow named James Crabtree. And James Crabtree, what he does is he uh, takes a survey of several recent books uh, about collapse that have come out. So it, there's a lot of good fodder in here for future interviews. So uh, I'm going to sit here and have this weekend long read. I'm going to go for 32 more minutes and then I'm going to put the link on here. You can just read it yourself or you can sit here and listen to me read it for 30 minutes unless I get a buyer at my open house and then you can take over from there. Take it away, Financial Times, and tell us how we are going to save the human race from extinction. <clears throat> Odds of just one in six do not sound great even in a simple game of chance. But if this were the probability that humanity itself could be wiped out, you might say we are in a fix. Yet, here we are, argues philosopher Toby Ord in The Precipice, a new book about the bleak survival chances we now face as a species. Let's, we're going to try to get Toby on the show, obviously. Those with a penchant for worrying about catastrophe already have plenty to be going on with as the corona panic continues its ground global march, setting off an array of scary thoughts about what the coming months might bring. Churches in the U.S. are now closed here on Easter Sunday. But newspapers last week pictured long lines outside gun shops, a sign that many are preparing in their own way for broader social disruption to come. And of course, what 
he was talking about here, more guns and ammunition were sold in the United States in March of 2020 than in any month in history going back to 1776. That is the only statistic you need to know pretty much, or you can look at the long lines at food banks. Check out Google picture of line at the San Antonio, Texas food bank a couple of days ago for a dose of reality. <clears throat> Visions of post-apocalyptic collapse are familiar from disaster movies or from novels such as Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Ord's concern is more with what he calls existential risk, an apocalypse in which there is no post, just the end of all of us. Hence his calculations of the chance of human life ending entirely during this century, one in six. Quoting uh, Toby Ord, quote, this is not a small statistical probability that we must diligently bear in mind, like the chance of dying in a car crash, but something that can readily occur, like the roll of a die, one in six, or Russian roulette, one in six, yes. A leading light in a movement known as effective altruism. Ord is also a researcher at the University of Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute, which, given his own odds making, must be a pretty bleak place to work. His book tallies up various apocalyptic scenarios, I have to keep an eye out the window here, from asteroid strikes to the one in 1,000 million chance of a stellar explosion in space taking the Earth with it. More alarming, and of course the ones we talk about here on, uh, uh, on YouTube, are the man-made anthropogenic threats, specifically climate change, broader environmental collapse, nuclear war, biotechnology, and artificial intelligence. These risks are new, coming together in the latter 20th century to create an era that Orr dubs the precipice, meaning one in which total human collapse remains alarmingly likely. Quote, if I am even roughly right about their scale, then we cannot survive many centuries with risks like this. Either humanity takes control of its destiny and reduces the risk to a sustainable level, or we destroy ourselves. Thank you, Toby. <clears throat> Many might quibble with the exactitude of Ord's probabilities, but his message about the rising likelihood of civilizational disruption is grimly convincing, all the more so for being delivered in admirably clear prose. Of his various apocalyptic horsemen, he worries most of all about Take a guess. Which one? I'm actually surprised about this. Unaligned artificial intelligence. I'm not sure what unaligned means in this context. Giving odds of one in 10 to the notion that future intelligent machines might wipe out their human underlings, a scenario that has also alarmed the likes of the late scientist Stephen Hawking and entrepreneur Elon Musk. And uh, remember, Stephen Hawking said right before he died that humans uh, weren't going to make it till the end of the 21st century. Uh, anyway, so what do you think comes in number two? How about pandemics? Pandemics are his second biggest fear. 
And he recalls how the Black Death wiped out as many as one half of all Europeans during the 14th century, or the earlier Plague of Justinian that swept through the Byzantine Empire in 541, reducing humanity's headcount by 3%. By comparison, by comparison, two days, coronavirus outbreak is mild. Mm. By comparison to the Black Death, by comparison to the Black Death coming down the pike, Today's coronavirus outbreak is mild. Thank you. Although it does provide a taste of the massive disruption, meaning economic and social disruption, a more lethal strain, a more lethal strain might bring, meaning in the near future. Okay. Uh, the real risk, the real pandemic risk, however, is man-made, specifically a bioweapon or lab-mutated virus. Now, a lot of people, and I am not rejecting this, say that the coronavirus, that's exactly what it was, was a bioweapon uh, that accidentally escaped from that lab in Wuhan, China. <clears throat> Back in 2012, Dutch virologist Ron Fauchier ran an experiment with uh, that especially deadly strain of bird flu that kills more than half of the humans it affects, albeit one that so far has not been transmissible between humans, the operative word being so far. Quoting, uh, or quote, he passed the disease through a series of 10 ferrets. By the time it passed to the final ferret, the strain had become directly transmissible between mammals, close quote. Even putting the risk of military bioweapons to one side, Fauchier's experiment caused an outcry underlining the potential for disaster, meaning, you know, an accidental release of a virus from a lab. Which, as I say, I, uh, you do not have to be a total conspiracy wacko to believe that is exactly, uh, there is very good evidence uh, that that's how the coronavirus started. Uh, although it's kind of a loop point at this point, isn't it? <clears throat> Chaotic hospital scenes in Wuhan and Lombardy make such risks easier to imagine, yet they do not solve the wider problem, namely that most of us find it all too easy to ignore those that might bring about a temporary social collapse let alone a humanity-ending disaster. So now we're going to go to the next book. Oliver Letwin's Apocalypse How sketches out just one scenario in which a fictional freak space weather magnetic pulse knocks out Britain's internet. We're talking an EMP pulse here. Now this one is naturally, but, but obviously this one uh, probably as easy as a virus, and the EMP is an easy thing for uh, humans to do to other humans. Uh, okay, so this is a, a, hy a hypothetical uh, scenario in which one of these magnetic pulses, I guess wherever they come from, knocks out Britain's internet electricity and other vital networks on New Year's Eve 2037 causing chaos and tens of thousands of deaths. A brainy former minister during David Cameron's premiership, Letwin was once in charge of Britain's disaster preparedness 
thinking through everything from natural catastrophes to malign outside interference similar to Russian cyber attacks that knocked out Ukraine's power supplies in 2015 and 2016. His bigger argument concerns the rising vulnerability of sophisticated industrialized societies given the complex interlocking techno technological networks that already underpin almost all of our social systems in the near future when everything from telemedicine to self-driving vehicles will be hitched up online the risks of a cascading network collapse will be greater still quote if the electricity grid and the internet go down in the late 2030s and if we have not taken every particular precaution it is likely that life as we know it will close down too and this is why I have been saying for years if you want to know when we have truly arrived at the end times collapse that is when you turn on the internet and the internet for whatever reason is down and you figure out it ain't coming back you have at most 72 hours to be wherever you want to live for the rest of your life in the company of whomever you want to live with for the rest of your life. The, the collapse of the internet is the trigger that the goose is cooked. Okay, I've mentioned these guys before. Similar worries vex Pablo Servine and Raphael Stevens, albeit on an even grander scale, in how everything can collapse. First published, it, it's a YouTube video, How Everything Can Collapse. I've, I've done a, a, uh, a former sermon on these guys. F first published in 2015 and only now translated from French, the duo are left-wing activists and researchers in a developing field they describe half-jokingly as collapsology. This covers plenty of ground from the risks of fossil fuel dependent energy systems to instability in international finance, but their concern is primarily ecological, namely the overburdening of the Earth's natural systems from the climate crisis to the collapse and biodiversity that now forces some farm workers in China to manually pollinate plants given declining numbers of bees. <clears throat> Five mass extinctions have scarred our planet's four and a half billion year history. The most, the most recent wiping out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Some scientists believe extensive habitat and species destruction is now causing a sixth Holocene distinction, extinction, meaning one in which three quarters of species disappear, quoting the authors of How Everything Can Collapse, quote, we are not there yet, but we are rapidly getting closer to this figure. <clears throat> All these more contemporary potential disasters share a common feature, namely that they result at some level from the intersection of globalization and technology. This is true for the corona panic outbreak, given that its rapid global spread was largely a function of the global transport integration you know, talking about airplanes mostly, even since the outbreak of SARS earlier this century. Globalization has brought huge benefits, but also levels of human interconnection and environmental strain that make now truly 
global catastrophes much easier to imagine. <clears throat> the word apocalypse derives from the Greek apocalyptian, meaning to uncover or to reveal a well-chosen route given the way thinking about disaster so often reflects anxieties about the present, religious apocalyptic visions focus on blinding flashes from vengeful deities, something replaced in the last century by the potential wipeout of a nuclear strike. Today's visions of collapse are more gradual, be that a spreading pandemic or the remorseless warming of our planet. Quoting Sir Vane and Stevens, quote, today climatic and environmental catastrophes are less spectacular, you know, than nuclear holocaust, but they have actually started. So, how should we prepare for such a possibility? Some take matters into their own hands. The subject of Mark O'Connell's Notes from an Apocalypse, a delightful peek into the world of preppers gearing up for imminent disruptions to our social or political order. Can you say the biggest number of guns and ammunition sold in the last month than in any month in U.S. history? From renovated nuclear bunkers being sold to well-heeled survivalists in North Dakota to nuclear disaster tourists in Chernobyl, I guess you hear that the forest right outside of Chernobyl is in flames as we're speaking today. O'Connell's book to be published next month is a wryly amusing tour of the end of the world. Over recent weeks, a handful of Asian nations such as Taiwan and Singapore have seemed like sanctuary states holding out against the virus's spread. But for those truly anxious about looming catastrophe, there is always New Zealand. Well, I think New Zealand has pretty much been shut down. PayPal founder Peter Thiel is just one of a bunch of libertarian billionaires and Silicon Valley entrepreneurs to buy land and houses in New Zealand, which O'Connell describes as, quote, the ark of nation states, an island having amid a rising tide of apocalyptic unease an island haven amid a rising tide of apocalyptic unease. He is especially good on the oddities of American survivalists, an almost exclusively male subculture that revels in packing meticulous bug out bags filled with survival gear and hangs out on internet discussion boards chatting about T-E-O-T-W-A-W-K-I, the end of the world as we know it, or the correct course of action when T-S-H-T-F. You probably can guess what that one means. <clears throat> All this reflects a deep anxiety about the direction of complex liberal urban societies. Quote, preppers are not preparing for their fears, they are preparing for their fantasies. The collapse of civilization means a return to modes of masculinity our culture no longer has much use for, to a world in which a man can build a toilet from scratch, or protect his wife and children from intruders using a crossbow, close quote. This might seem ridiculous, and O'Connell has plenty of fun treating it as such, but it merely begs the question of what sensible measures should be taken to prepare instead, especially when politicians find it so hard to focus on risks that are low probability 
and complex, or those such as climate change whose full effects will not be felt for decades. Servine and Stevens glimpse hope in the Transition Town Movement, a low-carbon community effort to build local self-sufficiency in advance of future disaster. They would almost certainly find much to admire in Extinction Rebellion whose calls for radical travel limits and sharply reduced consumption look remarkably like the results of the current coronavirus lockdown. More alarmingly, the duo flirts with the idea of collapseniks. I call them collapsitarians or collapseniks. Those thinkers who want deliberately to engineer economic collapse now in a perverse attempt to forestall even worse environmental catastrophes later. I'm just a collapse nick who wants to sell my house before engineering an economic collapse now in a perverse attempt to forestall even worse environmental catastrophes later. That's me. The dangers of this approach should be clear enough from the, from the genuine economic crisis spreading around the world over the recent weeks, not least in terms of the extreme backlash it would create. As Letwin argues, quote, liberal democracies are fragile, demagoguery is latent, and there is every reason not to test whether the liberal democratic system would prove robust in the face of calamity on this scale, close quote. Let when himself is more practical, suggesting greater international cooperation. Oh yeah, we're really seeing greater international cooperation in the last few weeks. Oh yeah, in particular, a new UN convention on global network protection. His other big idea is more old fashioned, specifically that government should invest in basic, oops, and then it's messed up here, can't read, anyway. In basic, probably basic services is what they meant to say there. Ord's ideas are mostly practical too. Ord's ideas are mostly practical also involving new international efforts to handle existential risks as well as policies to slow down and manage the development of risky technologies, not least AI. Much of this boils down to money. The global body overseeing prohibition of bioweapons has an annual budget of just over $1 million. Ord notes, quote, humanity spends more on ice cream every year than on ensuring that the technologies we develop do not destroy us. Changing this requires far more investment for expert-led global bodies such as the World Health Organization, which in any case should emerge in the coming years with many more resources, as well as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Amid the horrendous human cost, one welcome result of the pandemic should be that some of the feverish scenarios imagined by survivalists should be a little easier for the rest of us to imagine too. Just as important though is the realization that the actions from lone individuals are hopeless replacements for preparation that is well-sourced, collective, and global. Existential destruction would, by definition, be unprecedented. Yet our world is still littered with the ruins of once thriving civilizations that did at some point come to an end. 
mostly for reasons that modern societies are in a position to prevent. I, I honestly don't know at this point, that's the, uh, this is the last paragraph, if that was a typo or not. I literally do not know if they, if they were that apocalyptic, I mean, that apocalyptic in their Hollywood ending here, or did they mean to say uh, mostly for reasons that modern societies are not in a position to prevent, which is the correct statement. Uh, anyway, our own chances of survival may prove to be much greater than one in six, but the odds of serious disaster are also far higher than most of us would like to think. And there you go. Uh, James Crabtree, the author, is associate professor in practice at Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and author of The Billionaire Raj. Maybe uh, Sarah Lim uh, can meet up with James Crabtree and uh, get some ideas. Anyway, uh, well, it did not work. Uh, I was hoping that if I sat here and uh, sermonized long enough that some clueless moron would come driving up. The door is opening. Yes, Mr. Ghost? You want to buy this house, Mr. Ghost? Uh, I did have some people here earlier and they are very thrilled by the place and the real estate agent said she will be calling me about an offer in the next couple of days. So wish your old apocalyptic collapsitarian luck in selling a house in the collapse of the global industrial economy. So I'm gonna get out here on this gorgeous Easter Sunday afternoon with a shovel and start filling in the potholes in my yard. Happy Easter. Bye, guys. Yes, Mr. Ghost?